Hello everyone and welcome to Mountain View Community Church Online. We are back for the second weekend in a row and it looks like we'll be doing this for at least eight weeks or so. If you're new to Mountain View, especially if this is your first time with us, we're glad that you joined us. We're blessed that you're with us and hope you are blessed as well. At Mountain View, our aim is to teach God's Word in a relevant way. We want to present God's Word in a truthful, gracious way where you can know that we care about you, that we care about each other. Now in today's sermon, imagine yourself in northern Israel, on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and all is calm, everything is at rest, life is great, but then suddenly the skies grow dark. The wind picks up, the thunder cracks, the rain begins to pour. It gets dark and the waters begin to crest over the sides of the boat. You can't see a thing and you're terrified. What do you do? Well, maybe you cry for help. That's what I would do. And that's what we all need today. We all need help. We need help from God because only God can calm the storm. The good news today is that there is a God who cares about you. He loves you and he wants to help you. My prayer today is that as you learn about our almighty God, that you'll know that he can do something about what we're going through and that I pray you will reach out to him as you encounter the storm. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we focus on you today, may we know that you are bigger than the storm. May we know that you're there and may we know that we can trust you. Whatever we're facing, as we go through together this situation in our country, we thank you that you are still there and that we can rely on you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Psalm 34 says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord, let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Um, so we may not be able to actually be together this morning, but it doesn't mean that we can't worship together. Um, and, uh, and really what an incredible opportunity we have to, uh, to sort of flood the internet and social media with um, a message and a spirit of hope instead of a spirit of despair. So um, we just wanna enjoy, invite you guys to join with us this morning um, as we worship together. Praise to 
View. It's great to be with you guys today, and I'm here with Stacy Delisle. Stacy and Spencer have been part of the Mountain View family since 2007, mm -hmm. and they have been no strangers to adversity in their lives. So I thought it'd be great to hear a little bit from Stacy about how they're dealing with some of the circumstances that we're all facing. You know, uh, they've served in multiple roles throughout the church over these years, and most recently as home group leaders leading a group through some pretty troubled waters themselves. So uh, Stacy and Spencer have three amazing kids who are all 10 and under and suddenly find themselves all three at home all together. So let me turn to Stacy and ask you a few of these questions here. Um, so how has this coronavirus affected you, um, your family, the routines that you're in, and what are some of the changes that you guys have made? So like you said, we're all at home, which is very different for our family. Usually the kids are at school, Spencer's at work. So that has been a different dynamic for us, for sure. Um, one thing that's been really important that we've been working hard with our kids on is just keeping them in a consistent rhythm and routine. You know, with all the uncertainty that is happening in our world, creating a sense of normalcy in the midst of that for them is super important. We've also just had some really hard conversations and you know, kids, our kids not understanding why they can't go play with friends or their events and activities have been canceled. Um, but it has really allowed us such a real opportunity to pour into them, into their hearts, and really bind together as a family to figure out what our new normal looks like in the midst of this. Yeah. That's a great phrase, too, thinking of your new normal. Um, none of us really knows right. how long this is going to last. And uh, that's caused a lot of, I think, anxiety, you know, mm -hmm. both across the country, um, but even in our own hearts. Right. Uh, this kind of a change, suddenly we find ourselves wondering, well, my goodness, mm -hmm. what's next? And so how has this affected you personally? Uh, ha have you experienced some anxiety or some emotions? And, and if so, how are you finding yourself really leaning on Jesus during this time? Anxiety is something that I definitely struggle with and has been a long walk um, with God and I. And you know, it would be really easy, I think, in these circumstances to focus on everything that's happening and the, the trouble that we see facing our nation and our world. Um, right before this all kind of happened here in the U.S., we had our women's retreat, and the speaker, Ginger Harrington, who spoke, talked about um, practicing the presence of God and not really focusing on our problems, but focusing on who He is and she, in her book, she, she says this, she says, How do you choose to believe, to stand strong in faith while swirling in overwhelming uncertainties? And I think the answer to that, again, just really boils back down to our faith and understanding what it means to have faith. Um, in Hebrews chapter 11, the whole, the whole chapter is about what faith is and the heroes of our faith. And the way that it starts, it talks about now faith. You know, now, in this moment, what does faith look like, minute by minute, hour by hour, as new information is coming out, and just really making the choice to focus on who God says he is and knowing that his character doesn't change in the midst of uncertainties. Um, 
that has just really, I think, helped me stay grounded and to focus on what is true, what, what, we're, what is steadfast, and what stays the same regardless of anything else that's happening in our world. Yeah. That's great advice, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I think everybody's reeling a little bit with how to best deal with this. Um, you know, you've got three young children at home, mm -hmm. and uh, so maybe you have some advice for some other young moms that are at home with, with kids all of a sudden, or really for anybody that's listening. What, what would be maybe one or two things that you could share with us? Sure. So I think I would probably boil that down to three things, um, to look up, to look out, and to look forward. Mm. Um, so looking up, you know, in Psalms, one of my favorite verses says, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. And that's from Psalm 94, 19. And so being in God's word and looking to him and saying, okay, so what is his consolation? Where, you know, knowing that he is with us, he doesn't forsake us, that he knows what's happening. He already sees the end of this and just really grounding ourselves in in who God is. Um, secondly, looking out. So staying connected with other people, which, you know, can be tricky right now in this whole um, social distancing kind of thing. But, you know, we have the gift of technology and taking a look at how we can continue to to be together, whether it's over text or FaceTime or Zoom or whatever, just making sure that we are connected with one another, uh, with home group, with your Bible study group, with your neighbors. Um, I, I think that's just so super important. And then lastly, looking forward and thinking through how can we use this crisis as an opportunity to serve other people and how how can we use it as an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to share his love with other people? Um, I think my favorite verse of all time that has really kind of defined my life is Romans 15, 13. And it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we just have such an opportunity right now to be that hope to people who might be asking a lot of questions and um, I would just encourage everybody to look up and stay grounded in God, to look out, to be connected with one another, and to look forward and to look for ways to just be God's hands and feet to, to our communities, to our, our world, and to one another. Yeah. Stacy, that's great advice. And thanks so much for taking some time to come today and, and talk with me and talk with all of us uh, as we go through this journey together. And uh, as we get ready to hear the sermon, I'd just like to close our time in prayer and, uh, and kind of reflect on one of my favorite songs, mm -hmm. which is Psalm 34. And so why don't you join with me as we pray together? And I'm just going to read this psalm and, and use this as a base for us to pray. So this is Psalm 34. It says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So, Father, we believe this, that you are our refuge. Father, that you deliver us. God, that you protect us, that you are present with us. And so I'm just so thankful to be able to share this time together with our church Though we are not together physically, Lord, we are together and we are under your protective care. So would you continue to be glorified in this crisis that we're facing as a nation, as a county and a community here in Frederick, and even in our own families, Lord, help us to turn our hearts towards you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there are three things I never thought I would experience in Maryland. The first was an earthquake. And I've already experienced two of those the last 10 to 15 years here in Maryland. The second was a tornado. I thought those were just for Kansas and places like that. And just like six weeks ago, a tornado came through Monrovia. As you see in these slides here, around Richard and Tylene Crop's house, some 80 trees, between 30 and 80 feet tall, were uprooted from the ground. And that was just a scary day. 
I never thought I'd experience a tornado. But third, of course, is a pandemic like the one we're in right now. This, this coronavirus pandemic with schools being shut down, with church being closed down, with now restaurants and bars being closed down. And just the other day, last week, Governor Hogan said, no crowds over 250. And then Monday, he changed it to no crowds over 50. And then President Trump gets on TV and says, I think probably no crowds over 10. It makes me wonder, what do Dan and Joanna Hart do? They've got 10 kids. Which two are going to go, right? So this is an, an unprecedented time that we live in. And at times like this, we might ask, where is God? What is God doing? The unknown is bothersome to us. It's troubling to us. And I think you, like others, and even myself, are a little concerned, maybe a little bit anxious, perhaps a little stressed. And this affects us in so many ways, in mind, body, and soul. So if you are struggling, you are not alone. At Mountain View, we are doing our best to connect with everybody in the church. We sent out some uh, inquires to people, and we found a number of prayer requests came back. Some people said things like, pray for us, we have three family members who have asthma. Pray for us, we are in danger of losing our business. Pray the flu is running through our family. Pray for the health, wor health workers on the front lines. And so today, we need to realize that we need to hear from God. What does he have to say to us? And I felt led to teach from Mark chapter 4 where the disciples are caught in a storm with Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. Now, the coronavirus pandemic may not seem like a storm. It's clearly not a literal storm, but I believe it feels like one. So let's look at this passage. Let's see what the disciples learned. Let's see what they learned about Jesus, and let's see how it applies to us as well. I'm reading from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, and Mark writes, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still. Then the wide wind died down. It was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, let's note some details in this story. The mention of the time of day in verse 35 that was evening. The reference to Jesus just as he was in verse 36. The statement about the other boats. The position of Jesus in the boat. The mention of the cushion. The sharp rebuke made by the disciples and their terror and their bewilderment. Together, taking all of this together suggests the report of an eyewitness. The person who wrote this, Mark, either was there or he was good friends with someone who was there. And I think that likely was Peter. There are three main truths I want us to grasp today. And the first is that Jesus takes us into the storm. Jesus takes us into the storm. In verse 35, he's the one with the idea. He says, let us go. Let us go over to the other side. You see, the trip across the lake was Jesus' idea. Now, I'm not saying Jesus caused the storm, but I get the impression that he knew it was coming, and he took them into it. You know, Jesus knows things most of us don't know. Now, if you had been their leader, and if you had gotten a weather report saying a storm was coming, you, like I, would have canceled that trip, right? See, no one uh, voluntarily takes a group onto a sea knowing a violent storm is about to come up. If you see the radar on your cell phone, you avoid that like the plague. You cancel, and you go on your trip the next day. Now, a little bit of setting here, the Sea of Galilee. It's about eight miles wide, it's about 13 miles long, it encompasses roughly 41,000 acres. It rests at 696 feet, or 212 meters below sea level. It's surrounded by mountains gouged with deep ravines, and this makes the Sea of Galilee extremely susceptible to violent downdrafts and to sudden storms. Lori and I were there about two years ago when we had our trip to Israel. 
We were there on a calmer day. And you see these slides. You see the first one we had just set, a, set out onto the water. You see also in the background uh, the mountains. And you, you see how it is, it, the, the, the conditions are perfect for storms suddenly come upon you. As we got out far into the lake, the, our tour guide put on some worship music. And you see some of us here raising our hands, worshiping, our, worshiping God, just thankful for this opportunity we had on this beautiful day on the Sea of Galilee where Jesus actually walked. And they too, I think, on this moment, the disciples, the, the end of the day was over. They, the worst was behind them, so they thought. They had some time for some rest and relaxation. The boat was calm, but not for long. Because verse 37 says that a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. The picture here. The image here is of waves repeatedly crashing into the boat. It was as if the lake was being shaken by, almost by God, and at any moment all the men on board could be swamped to a watery grave. Now, I can't say that I have ever been in an experience quite like this one, partly because I'm not a fisherman, and I have never owned a boat, and I have never really gone sailing, but I am sure that some of you have. The worst experience I ever had on a boat was back in 2006 when Lori and I went for our 20th anniversary on a Western Caribbean cruise. And so some of you may have done a cruise like that. Imagine that day we were going to go snorkeling. So we were to take a catamaran from our site out to where we would snorkel. And it was, I think, a 1 o'clock or so was the excursion. And I ate some Chinese food on the boat right before that. Bad idea. So we get out in the boat. It's a beautiful day. The sun's hitting down. Our boat is going in this direction. I'm sitting the way I'm now in this direction. And within minutes, I'm starting to feel sick. Like, I don't think this is a good idea, but we were already out in the water. I had to get up because I thought, I'm going to lose it right here. And I got up and I walked and headed my way over to the restroom, which was near the rear of the boat. When I got about there, I noticed there was already a line of three people. I was not the only one sick. It was a beautiful day, but the sun was beating down. I was facing one direction. The boat was going another direction. That was not the way to do this. And I wanted to get in that restroom so bad, but some guy stayed in it for like 20 minutes. So I just held on, held on, looked straight ahead, and I just survived that worst 30 minutes of my life. We got to the site. I actually was able to snorkel, saw some pretty cool fish, enjoyed it. But when I got back on the boat, I was now a veteran. I'm like, I'm standing in the front of the boat. Of the boat. I'm going to be holding on for dear life, looking straight ahead, and I am not going to lose it. There were a lot of people that bent over the side of the boat and, you know, threw up over the side. But I hung on and survived. That was my day at the sea, but I'm never, ever doing that again. Now, you may not have experienced a storm like the disciples did, but we all have figurative storms we face. Situations that bring heartache and, and grief and anxiety and conflict. And it's unlike, not unlike the squall experienced here. What we have to ponder is this. If Jesus is actually the one who takes us into the storm, does that mean he doesn't care? Does that mean he doesn't care about our health, about our possible loss of a job or loss of income? Does it mean he doesn't care about our kids? I think he does. And just read the Gospels, and everywhere Jesus went, he cared about everybody. He cares about you. So then why does he take us into the storm? Why did he take them into a storm? Perhaps it's because there are some things we will never learn while the sea is calm. And that brings me to my second truth, and that is Jesus is with us in the midst of the storm. In verses 37 to 38, we see here in verse 38 that Jesus went to sleep. Now, it's very interesting that this is the only place in all of the Gospels where Jesus is said to have slept. Now, we know that Jesus, of course, slept. He slept like any other man. He slept every day of his life. But this is the only place where it's, we, we see him sleeping. And he must have been very tired because he slept through such a violent storm. The truth is it had been a very long and strenuous day. Now let's learn a little bit more about that day. It was a long day. If you have your Bible, you go back to Matthew 3, 22, it began 
back then. The day began in Matthew 3, 22 with some blasphemous accusations by the Pharisees that Jesus was controlled by Beelzebub or the devil. It was a fierce accusatory confrontation. In addition to this, you may recall that his mother and brothers had attempted to kidnap him and take him back to Nazareth. They thought he was out of his mind. I think we could safely say that was not a vote of confidence. And then, leaving the crowd, he went down by the sea, where amidst a great press of people, he began to teach in parables. The crowd was so large, he had to get out in the boat to, to separate himself from the crowd. And he taught from that boat the rest of the day in the hot sun. And finally, with the approach of evening, Jesus was exhausted, and he gave the order to pull out. So why was Jesus asleep in the boat? Well, for two reasons. First, fatigue. He was beat. He was drained. He was physically and emotionally drained. And second reason, he had no fear. Jesus lived his entire life in dependence upon God the Father. He knew that he could entrust the cares of this world to his Father in heaven. And so he slept even while the storm was on the horizon. Jesus never feared. You know, sleep sometimes isn't easy to come by, is it? We've all had nights, I know I have, where you've gotten up at 2 in the morning and you couldn't get back to sleep for hours. You can't turn your mind off of what happened the previous day or what's going to happen the coming day. Sometimes it's just hard to sleep, but on this night, Jesus had no problem sleeping whatever, whatsoever. He was tired, but he also had trust in God. So how do you trust the Lord in your current storm? By remembering that he is in the boat with you. Simply put, he is with us in the midst of the storm. As verse 38 says, Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. No wonder he fell asleep. He had his own pillow. The main point here is that to the disciples, he appeared to be unaware of their plight. They're afraid and they can't believe that Jesus has gone to sleep on them. But the fact is this, yes, he is asleep, but he hasn't left them. He is there with them. Now, back in the early 80s, I believe I visited a Christian bookstore. I found a, a poster of a poem that I had to have and I bought it. It became very popular. It was called Footprints. And I want to read it for you. I think it was written in the early 60s, it became popular in the 80s. And I want to read this poem to you. It goes like this. One night a man had a dream. He dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the dark sky flashed scenes from his life. For each scene he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to him and the other to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path of his life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled him. And so he asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you that you'd walk with me all the way. But I've noticed that during the most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you most, why would you leave me? The Lord replied, My precious, precious child, I love you and I would never leave you. During your times of trial and sufferings, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. You know, I think that in a way the disciples felt a little bit like that man in the poem. Where Jesus where are you when we need you and you're asleep in the stern? I think sometimes when we get in the storm, even if we know he's there, we get confused. We fail to trust him. In fact, we can get mad just as they rebuked him because it says here, teacher, don't you care if we drown in verse 38? The disciples rebuked Jesus because they jumped to the wrong conclusion. But you know, it does feel to them that Jesus, the one time we need you and you're snoring away. A couple of weeks ago, as we were about to realize that this coronavirus was really going to impact our country, I believe the, the Dow went down a, a thousand points or so. And, and Lori and I have a financial advisor, and he manages our retirement. 
And I know Lori looked into it and, and emailed her brother-in-law who knows a lot about stocks. Should we sell now? And he said, hold tight. And, and that was a weekend. But Monday morning, she called our advisor who, who's in Pennsylvania. And she got on the phone and, and she, the, the lady who answered the secretary and said, hey, I want to talk to our advisor because we want to talk about selling. She said, well, I'm sorry, but Mr. Frable, he's on vacation. And Lori's like, you got to be kidding me. He's on vacation. She said, and he's the only one that can sign off if you're going to transfer your money out. You're going to have to wait till he gets back from vacation. And she's thinking, why do we even have a financial advisor when we're in this storm? He's on vacation. We can't get a hold of him. I think that's a little bit how the disciples felt. Why do we even have the Lord when, when we're in the storm? He's sleeping in the boat. Murphy's Law triumphs again, doesn't it? But I think sometimes God lets us be at our wit's end to teach us a principle. Not only that Jesus is with us in the midst of the storm, but the third point I want to make is that Jesus is bigger than the storm. Jesus is so much bigger than the storm that he gets up. It says he woke up and he rebuked the wind. Notice what he said. He doesn't yell. He doesn't scream. He simply speaks up with authority and power to show that he's in charge. He rebukes the wind and he calmly says to the waters, quiet, be still. And it says here, even the wind and the waves obey him. A great calm. The Greek language paints the picture that the storm just became calm suddenly. It didn't take 10 minutes, but immediately the waves grew calm and the wind stopped blowing. Do you remember what the disciples called him earlier? Verse 38, teacher, teacher, do you not care? Teacher, you see, they had followed Jesus, but they didn't fully understand who he was yet. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say, church, let's say when the, the coronavirus pandemic is over back in church, and I say to everyone at all three services, hey, it's going to be a beautiful day this Sunday afternoon. I want us all to head over to the lake, and I want us to go on this lake. I've rented this huge boat. We can all get on this huge boat. And let's say 5 o'clock that afternoon, we all get in this huge boat, the whole entire church, like this huge church picnic, but we're out in a boat. And I get on the boat. And I crash because I'm so tired from preaching three sermons and I fall asleep and I'm just snoring in the boat. Suddenly the, the rain comes, the thunder comes, the, maybe even there's some lightning and, and it gets dark and the wind picks up and the, and the water's begin to crest over the side of the boat. And, and the elders of the church are like, Pastor Guy, where's Pastor Guy? And you find me and you, I'm sleeping and say, Pastor Guy, don't you care that we're about to drown? The whole church is going under, don't you care? And what if I just woke up, I got up, I said to the wind, I rebuke the wind, I say, seize, be quiet, be still. And everything just became calm. Do you think anyone in this church would ever call me pastor guy again? <laughs> no, they'd probably say, hey, hey, pastor God or guy, Lord guy. They, they would realize I'm somebody more important than a teacher or a pastor. That's what Jesus is showing them. He is not merely a teacher. He is Lord. He is God in the flesh. So the response, verse 41, they were terrified. They asked each other, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him. So who is Jesus? Who is he? Well, he's the light of the world. He's the resurrection and the life. He is the good shepherd. He is the great physician. He is the bread of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the king of the kings and the Lord of lords. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He is more than a teacher. He is more than a philosopher. He is more than a guru. He is God who came to earth, and he has authority over heaven and earth. And when he takes us into the storm, we have to know he is bigger than the storm. He's in the storm with us, but he is over the storm. It doesn't scare him. And church family, it doesn't need to scare you either. 
He says to the disciples in verse 40, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Well, they're afraid because they're afraid they're going to drown. I wouldn't want to drown either. But you don't have to be afraid either. I want to share two verses with you before we close. One from the New Testament and then one from the Old Testament. Matthew 10, 29 to 31, Jesus says this, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I mean, you are worth more than a sparrow. He's numbered all the hairs of your head. Nothing will happen to you without God knowing it, and God will have something to take care of it for you. And second, I love Psalm 46, verse 10. I'm reading what I believe is the King James Version. It says, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes you just have to take a deep breath. And we have to be still. We have to cease striving and know that he is God. So whatever storm you're facing today, it might be big, but it's not as big as you think it is. Jesus is bigger. And you're not there all alone. Jesus is there with you. He's just waiting for you to come to him and say, Jesus, I need some help with this storm. Will you speak to it for me? And I know we are going through unprecedented times. And you might be facing loss of employment. You might be having a health risk. You, you might be in a conflict or whatever it is you're facing during this time. We all have different pressures. We all face something. I just want you to know that Jesus, he's got you. He's got your back. He's not going to take us in the storm and not go with us. Remember, he's there. Just call on him. I want to ask you as we close, for those of you watching, have you ever come to a point in your life where you called on the name of the Lord Jesus and you began a personal relationship with him? If you're sure not how, just three things. Just tell God, say, Lord, I need you. I need you in my life. Second, tell God, I trust you. Jesus, I'm trusting you to be my savior, the one who died for me and rose from the dead. I'm trusting you to be my everything. And third, I follow you. Jesus, I'm going to commit my life to follow you as my Lord. If you make that commitment, he will come in your life, and I know he will always be with you, whatever storm you face. So trust him today. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. He wants to be your best friend, and he can be trusted. God bless you. Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive Hallelujah, and I will 
mystery And I raise a hallelujah Fear you lost your hold on me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Hey, Pastor Kenny here. What a great reminder that Jesus is with us in the storm and he's bigger than the storm. Man, did we need that today. Hey, a couple announcements as we close our time together. First off, join us tonight live at 5 on MVCC Facebook page. Pastor Guy and Pastor Matt will be doing a Q&A regarding things from the message and others. So join us live at 5 on the MVCC Facebook page. As a reminder, in light of the government official and the CDC recommendations, the MVCC campus is closed until further notice. So there won't be any meetings or gatherings or any kind of groups on campus until further notice. But we do want to continue to be the community that reaches a community. And that only happens through your faithful giving. So we want to encourage you, continue to give, even in hard times, and we know it's tough, give as God leads you. And you can do that in three ways. First is online at mvccfrederick.com. Second, you can also give by texting 301 888-5151. And finally, you can mail it into the church office at 8330 Fingerboard Road, Frederick, Maryland, 21704. Finally, and most importantly, let us know how we can be caring for and praying for you. Whether that's for you or a neighbor or family members, there's tons of needs and cares in our community, and we want to care and reach out to those. So let us know. You can do that by emailing the church office at office at mvccfrederick.com or calling the church office at 301-874-0000. I'm going to hand it back over to Pastor Guy for a closing prayer. Thanks for being with us this morning. I want to thank you for worshiping with us today. Now looking ahead, we are going to begin a new three-part Easter sermon series titled, A Look at Jesus. In addition, we're going to stare down COVID-19 by beginning a 19-day daily devotional. We will begin by posting it on Wednesday, March 25th. You can go to the church website, you can download your own copy and follow along with us there. In closing, as we find ourselves in this storm, whether the storm gets worse, or whether it calms down in the days to come, remember Jesus is with you in the storm and that he's bigger and we can trust him. 
And if you've never committed your life to Jesus, why not do that right now? Don't wait. Why not tell him that you want him in your life, that you want to trust him as your Savior and follow him as your Lord? So as we close, I hope you'll join us again next week. But if you've not yet made that commitment to invite Christ in your life, I want to give you that chance right now. So as we pray, make this your prayer and let him in your life. Let's pray. Dear Lord, for the person who's not yet called on you but wants to, even right now, I pray they tell you something like this. Dear Lord, I need you. I want you in my life. Would you come in? Lord, I trust in you. I believe Jesus died for all my sins and rose from the grave. My faith is in him alone. And Lord, I want to follow you. I give my life to you. I want to be yours. I want you to be mine. Thank you for coming to my life. Help me to follow you the best I can. And Lord, in the midst of these storms, I'm going to look to you because I know you will always be with me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.